All right guys, welcome back to the video. So in this one, we're gonna be restoring this Miller Falls 17 inch breast drill. So before we get going on the restoration of this thing, let's talk about it first, because this is a cool piece of history. So this is called a breast drill because it's the largest of kind of the egg beater style drills. And it's got this stock in the back that can either be put up here against your chest, against your shoulder, anything like that to give you good support when you're drilling a hole. This thing was usually meant for drilling bigger holes. You'd use your smaller egg beater style drills for drilling some of your smaller pilot holes in that. But this guy was meant for drilling nice big holes, so you had a lot of support and the option to give yourself a lot of torque. By pulling your handle all the way out here, you can get a serious amount of torque on the drive wheel here, so that's pretty dang cool, and then you can also move it in to make it a little bit more comfortable. The drill also has two different speed settings, which might sound kind of weird when we're talking about a manually powered drill, but you'll see what I mean in just a minute here. So right now we are on the high speed setting. So if I turn this right now, you can see just how fast the jaws are moving there. This would be the high speed setting. And then on the original model of this, you would have had a little knurled knob that you could undo by your hand but obviously this one has been replaced over time but then all we have to do is pop that little screw out take this whole gear assembly move it to the second hole here that's a little bit closer down reinstall our screw and you can see that we're now moving at a much slower speed so i'm moving my hand just as fast as the first time but the chuck is moving much much slower so the way that this is achieved is by having two different gear settings so that's all due to this outer drive wheel you can see the outer side of teeth here this is the high speed then on the inside there there's the low speed depending on which one of these holes you put the shaft into depends on which teeth line up with this drive gear right here because this is what's actually attached to the chuck and creates that turning now also on the drill here we've got some pretty cool other features so there's this old school level in here which i'm pretty sure is probably shot by now it's probably not going to work out nicely but it's a really cool addition that they added on there just to make sure that you're drilling nice and straight down there's also a nice little lock on here so there's this little tab hidden right in here and all you do you press that down that locks out this drive gear and now it's much easier to tighten up your chuck when you're putting a new bit in so in terms of the restoration there's not actually really anything we have to do to this at this point in time this thing is in perfect working order all i want to do is just go through and clean it up a little bit uh take off some of that natural patina that has built up over time which is mainly just rust so we're going to strip this whole thing down we're going to it in some rust dissolving solution we're going to clean up our wooden handle as best we can all that kind of stuff just getting this thing to look nice and pretty again because that's kind of the funnest part of buying these old tools is making them look like new again so it should be pretty easy to disassemble this thing that's one of the best things about working with old tools is that they were meant to be disassembled and maintained and taken care of unlike our modern day drills where there's not really a good way to take this apart assemble it disassemble it clean it anything like that you're better to just leave it the way it is lest you screw something up and it doesn't work anymore So I've got it mostly disassembled now. The only thing I can't disassemble is the actual, this jaw section here, uh, because I cannot figure this out for the life of me. There's apparently a whole bunch of different ways that they've put these together over the years of, the, of making this same drill. So there's definitely a main shaft that runs to the body here uh, that this is connected to. So this is one solid piece, and then this gear is added on afterwards. So then in this gear, there is a little pin that's running through, but on some of the older models, the pin ran all the way through, so you could actually hammer it out. On this one, I can only find it on one side, so it doesn't look like the pin runs all the way through so there's no way to get it out but the other weird thing is on the top here it does look like there is some kind of like a hex nut or something so it really is kind of a weird i can't figure it out at all but what i did find kind of interesting is that there's these two knurled knobs right here and what these are meant for is to actually take up the slack in the gear here because if we tighten them all the way down you can see that there's actually a pretty good amount of slop in there but just by adjusting these the tightness of these that then takes out all the slop but still gives you free movement the same thing with the screw that was in here that i was desperately trying to take out this is just meant so that once you take that slop out you tighten up this screw and it compresses the body down here so that these little thumb screws here can't be moved in and out anymore then you theoretically should never have to worry about the slop coming back in there the other interesting thing here is on the actual outside of the chuck here we have all of the manufacturing dates so this is how i knew it was a mills falls it says right on it mills falls uh it even has the manufacturing date here the problem is is this the one area of the chuck here that has the worst possible rust is right over the year of manufacturing so i can very easily read that it was june 25th that it was manufactured uh and then i can kind of start to make out the numbers and it looks by my by my best guess it looks like 1907 possibly uh which is it i can definitely see a one a nine and a zero so we know that it's going to be pretty old it's just that last number that is uh, 
basically unreadable. The other interesting thing here is that there's actually a little hole right here. And what I'm pretty sure this is for is just for oiling. I can't find anything that goes in it, around it, anything like that. And it actually worked quite well when I was trying to figure out how to loosen up this area. I, I sprayed some WD-40 in there and that actually loosened up these two uh, knurled knobs here. So I'm guessing that that's just so that you can lubricate this middle area here. So that's, again, really just a really interesting touch. It sucks that I'm not gonna be able to remove this assembly because that would make, you know, dealing with this thing a heck of a lot easier. But I'm just gonna have to take my time and be very careful when I'm dealing with this inner area here to make sure that I get all the water, all the rust remover, all that kind of stuff out of here so that it doesn't cause any internal damage that I can't see. And I'll just make sure to blast that with some WD-40 when, when it's all said and Done. That way we protect everything that's kind of in there that we can't get to. So before we move all this stuff into the rust solution, I'm gonna set this aside. I'm gonna put it in a baggie and not touch it for a while because I'm not sure what is actually holding in this glass level in here uh, in place. It very well could be lead in there. And if it is lead, I don't wanna deal with it. So it's not something that you'd be touching anyway, so it's probably not a big risk if it is lead. But before I really do anything with it, I wanna make sure I know what it is. So I'm gonna order a lead testing kit off of Amazon, which is basically just some swabs that you can, you know, you rub it on there and just can, you can test it pretty easily that way. So we're just gonna set this piece aside until I get that kit and I can actually know what I'm dealing with here. That way I know whether or not I have to be wearing gloves all the time, that kind of thing. It's really just whatever that stuff is on the inside there that I don't know if I really want to uh, deal with it because yeah, who knows? Who knows what it is at this point and I would like to rule out the fact that it might be lead. We got rid of 99% of the rust on this thing and it's looking really, really good now. All of our components are down to basically bare metal and like I said, it looks really good. So we're now ready to move on to painting. So on the body, the main drive gear and the shoulder piece, we're gonna be painting these all this nice uh, kind of bluey green. So this is a color that I really, really like and I think it's gonna look good having the whole body of this thing that nice green color. Now this is gonna piss off a lot of people that really like you know restoring tools back to the original state because I have no idea how to do that. I bought it mainly to have this tool in my shop. I've wanted one of these for a while uh, because they are a fairly handy tool to have around and I really like the idea of putting it in my own colors, just kind of making it my own tool. Now, before we do this, one of the interesting things is I was actually able to pretty accurately date this drill to within a few years. Now, I can't read the date any better on here, but what I can read a lot better is that this is only a patent date. And so I was able to actually look up the patent date and the patent is specifically for these jaws. And these are actually really cool because they're meant to hold any kind of bit that you want to put in here. So they've got this hollowed out section in here so they can hold kind of your square shafted tapered bits. So those bigger, so those old style auger bits that you'll see quite often, but they also have a little circular part in there so they can hold anywhere from an eighth inch up to a half inch uh, shank bit so that's a so that's a really cool design so it's actually really going to be interesting to see what I can fit in here and what I can use this for now like I said I was able to pretty accurately date this drill using a few different things here now the first thing is that this main drive wheel here has remnants of green paint on it so on the back side here you can see that it was green all around the main body as well as on the inside of the gear it had green on it now that was actually the biggest giveaway in what this drill was I was able to identify it as a Miller Falls number 12 drill and most of the ones that you'll find actually have a red color scheme to them so this main gear is painted red and that was and so that was where I kind of started my search so there will be a link in the description to the site that I used to identify this but I was able to find kind of the cap off here so in 1921 is when Miller Falls started painting all of these red rather than the green that they were using before so that kind of gave me the end production the trick is that these drills were made from I believe 190 something I don't remember it was it was it, it was in the early really early 1900s is when they started making these drills but the next key factor here is the fact that these two little knobs that I pointed out earlier in the video now what these do is they help take up the slack and that very easily dated this drill from being made between 1917 and 1919. So we've got a two year span in there, but either way you look at it, this drill is easily over a hundred years old. The fact that this is a piece of history is going to make a lot of people mad that I'm just painting it whatever colors I want. I'm not restoring it. But again, this is a drill. This is just my drill. This is going to be my drill forever. I have zero plans of ever selling this thing. I hope to pass it down to my grandkids someday. 
uh, because it's just a cool piece of history and the longer it can be in service, the cooler I think it's gonna be. So if you guys remember back when we did this hand plane here, all I did was I taped off the body and then I just used some uh, high gloss black spray paint over the middle area here to then paint that area. Now I deeply regret doing it in this way because it doesn't look great. Mainly the high gloss black looks really bad and the spray paint really doesn't do a good job of coating. Now it does work, don't get me wrong, if you don't have the other option we're gonna talk about in just a minute here, the spray paint works just fine, but I forgot about my big expensive option that I have sitting right here that I could have used on this hand plane. And at some point in the future here, I am going to strip off this high gloss paint and I'm going to be replacing it with the green that we're putting on this drill. And this is actually a really cool point that was brought up by, uh, I forget the guy's name, but his channel is Wood by Wright. Uh, what he does on all the tools that he restores or anything that he builds, he uses a very specific color of paint so that it highlights the fact that he restored, he, you know, he built that tool. And I think it's really cool because when you see in the background of his shop, you can see kind of his normal hand planes. Then you see some that are painted blue and those are the ones that he's restored, he's made new again. And I think that that is such a cool idea, being able to highlight which tools you've restored, all that kind of stuff, and just kind of customizing them to yourself. But anyway, the method we're gonna be using for painting this drill is using an airbrush. Now, when I was much younger, you know, in grade school and that, I used to build little military figures and vehicles and all this kind of stuff. And using an airbrush is the by far the best way to paint those kinds of things. It's also really nice because I have a little spray booth that I can set up to, you know, hold everything so that I can just work in the garage here. I don't have to set it up outside. This will suck up all of the paint fumes in that. So massive change of plans here. This Home Depot enamel paint is not actually enamel paint. Well, it might be enamel paint, but it's not oil-based enamel paint, which is what I thought all enamel paint was. So we're not gonna be able to use this stuff. Basically what's happening is as I try to mix in the paint thinner, which is typically what you use to thin out enamel paints, is that it's globbing up, it's separating into a chunk of paint and a chunk of paint thinner. So they're just not mixing and it's not thinning out of the paint at all, which means I can't put it through the airbrush. So this was a complete waste of money. Screw you to Home Depot for not properly labeling your products as being water or oil-based. There's nothing on the jar or on the website about what this actually is based on, whether it is oil or, or water-based. So I, I don't like Home Depot at the moment. So instead I ran down to Canadian Tire and picked up some trim clad oil-based technology paint. So I do know that this is oil-based paint, so we should be able to thin it down with the paint thinner and use that in the airbrush here. So I got flat black, which is what we're gonna be using on the body of the drill, as well as a couple other parts. Then I got gloss regal red, which is a little bit of a darker red. And we're gonna be using this on the drive gear, as well as a few of the other components to give it that little bit of a punchier look.
Okay, so our paint job is done and our pieces are looking amazing. This is the main drive gear here in that new enameled red, and I really love the look of it. Now, I've let all of my pieces cure up for 24 hours, so the paint is nicely hardened up and ready to be actually be used. So on all of our red parts, I use gloss regal red uh, trim clad paint. Now, I went for this purely because I couldn't get green. I would have preferred to go a dark green, but the red is also a pretty cool touch in my opinion. The only thing I don't love about this is the fact that it's gloss. And so I'm interested to see how this looks when we put it all together because on the body of the drill, I used a flat black paint. This is more the look that I like, but it also is kind of cool having that glossy part on our kind of accent pieces. Alright guys, so the drill is done and I am not super thrilled with what I have done on this project. This project took an absolute turn for the worst. I had a really cool idea for what I wanted this to be and that did not go according to plan. So first off with the paint job here, this looks like if you wanted to cosplay Darth Vader as a woodworker, this would be his perfect tool. Uh, so not uh, not super great with the uh, color scheme there on my own part. But my biggest issue with what I've done to this tool is I took a beautiful hundred year old tool and I coated it in paint, covering up all of the historical significance and details, you know, any of the stuff that you could use to date it, it's all gone now. And I didn't really think about this until I put the drill back together after painting it. It was only at that moment that I realized what I'd done. And I'll be completely honest, it's taken me three or four days to actually get to the point where I can record this end clip here without getting all choked up and really upset about what I did here. I'm extremely disappointed with the decisions that I made on this drill. This is not something that I am proud of. And I honestly was gonna scrap this video, but I figured that it's a good learning opportunity for myself and for everyone else. Because as you guys know, that's mainly what I do on my channel, is I screw up something, I explain it so that we all can kind of move on with our lives. So my issue with this is not kind of the tacky paint job that I put on it, it's mainly the fact that I just covered up and lost all that history of it. So if you guys are interested in restoring your own hand tools, you know, just not, not even for sale, just for your own collection and that kind of stuff, I think it is a cool idea to kind of personalize it to yourself. I think I already talked about wood by right he all the all the tools that he restores all the stuff that he builds he paints it with this kind of he paints it with this blue paint so that you know which tools he's restored in that and i think that that's a really cool touch and on something like a hand plane having the body of the plane painted a certain color that doesn't ruin the history of that tool it doesn't really matter what color the inside of that plane is it's still a cool traditional like stanley plane or whatever and it still has all of its significant dating factors on it you know you can find the date you can find all the, the manufacturing details whereas on this drill one of the significant factors that i used used to figure out how old it was, was the fact that the drive wheel here had green paint on it originally. So the fact that I just covered up that significant factor uh, on this drill is kind of a shame. And I'm very, again, I'm very upset about it. I'm not, uh, I'm not super thrilled about it. So like I said, if nothing else, this was a good learning opportunity. It sucks that I had to sacrifice a very old antique tool, but this is like, this is a, the best learning opportunity I ever could have had. Uh, because going forward, I am going to continue doing a whole bunch of tool restorations. I actually, there's a pile on the end of the workbench there of tools that I just picked up yesterday. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you know what they are. I also have a whole bunch of Miller Falls egg beater drills that I ordered off of eBay. I got four of them that are going to be coming sometime around Christmas here. And those ones look like they do need a little bit of restoration work. But what I'm going to be paying very specific attention to on future restoration projects or just tool or just not even restoration, but just getting a tool back to its functional order is just respecting and understanding the history of the tool. So this is a significant factor that makes something special, you know, like again, in this case on this drill, the fact that it had that green paint, I want to highlight that. There was a lot of good learning opportunities here. I think I've covered them all. And well, now we're just left with a Star Wars drill that again, is fully functional and I can use on future projects. Speaking of which, we now need to give it a quick test run to actually make sure that this thing drills.
So is it a direct replacement for the uh, modern style battery operated drill? Probably not. It's a uh, very slow cutting and I think definitely for these drills I'm gonna need to get the auger bits. Uh, they do work with the brad point bits, but having an actual, but having the more traditional style auger bit that has a threaded bit at the end of it, that actually pulls the bit forward, so you don't always have to be pushing the whole way through. From what I've read, those work a hell of a lot better than any modern brad point or twist bit that you're going to try chalking up in here. But the trick is that they do work. I am looking for a set of those auger bits. It is hard to find them uh, because they are, when you do find them, they're either very expensive, or if they're not expensive, they're usually busted up pretty good. So we're going to have to make use of this wherever I possibly can. So what I first tried to do with this is I tried to just go downwards. Now, obviously, as you guys can see with a long bit in there like the half inch uh brad point bit that i was using it's just too big i can't get my i can't get into my shoulder or anything like that it's just in too awkward of a position to get into a good spot uh because it's a fairly large thing but what these were typically used for was putting in big bits and then you would brace it against your body hence for the need for this rounded stock here and the whole point was just to drill holes into you know sides of things you know if you're doing like timber framing and that you would have your beam up there and you'd be able to drill your hole all the way through and that's where this level actually comes in really handy even when i was just playing around with it on this piece of cherry here i was able to drill an accurately level hole all the way through because you're just following a little bubble level here and it's actually surprisingly easy to keep that bubble lined up in the middle of the level there and just kind of keep twisting the handle here until you drill that nice perfectly uh aligned hole but anyways guys that's gonna do it for this tool video i don't know whether to say this was a good one this was a bad one it wasn't really bad but it also was you know, I'm not feel I'm not leaving this project feeling great. So let me know what you guys think. If you guys have done any tool restorations yourself, let me hear some of your horror stories that you've perpetrated or you've seen. Uh, I would love to hear them so that we can all learn from other people's mistakes too. But as always, guys, I do hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one.